Hey guys. Hi, how are you? Good morning. Good All morning. right, Kate, before we even get started, what everybody wants to know, will you be setting anything on fire on this stage? <laughs> no, they made it very clear right before I came out here. She was like, I, you, you know better than that, right? And I, they confiscated my blowtorch. It's back there and it's like in this cage right now. <laughs> so if the police show up and escort you out, it's because you brought a blowtorch. It won't be the police, right? it'll be the fire marshal. That's, oh, fair enough. But I know the ones here in Austin, so I think they'd be on my side. Yeah, my Uber driver coming over here was like, are you ladies gonna blow up the convention center? I'm like, not intentionally. I can't confirm nor deny, <laughs> but it's certainly possible. Well, we're so happy to have you here. Thank you. We're both Midwest gals, UT alum. Of course, you're a UT professor. All right, tell me about when science became something that you fell in love with. And we'll talk about your chemistry teacher in high school, but before that, as a kid, ooh. Well, it's interesting because I've always wanted to know why. That I drove my parents crazy. We had this family we were really close with growing up. They lived 30 minutes away. And so we would drive to this family's house all the time. And my parents would count the number of questions I would ask on that trip. And I don't remember what the record is, but it got, it got pretty high. Because I just wanted to know why. Every time I'd see something, I'd be like, how does that work? Why does that work that way? And I just always wanted to know why. Um, and so I've had that inquisitive mind. But it, like you said, it wasn't until I met that one teacher in high school where it really turned into just asking questions to being like, oh, I like science and chemistry specifically. So tell me, it was Mrs. Pals Rock? Pals Rock, right? Yeah, Mrs. Kelly Pals Rock from Portage, Michigan. She was my sophomore chemistry teacher. She would run around the classroom, light stuff on fire. She was just this most amazing woman. woman. And honestly, when I'm teaching, I try to think about her and channel her because if I just do like a little bit of what she did, I know I'm going to change the, the direction of my students because my chemistry teacher was so excited that ever since I was 15, I knew I wanted to be a chemist. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Like teachers, just can do so much with just their passion and excitement. Yeah, and it's amazing the difference between a good teacher and a bad teacher. Sometimes I think about how all of my history teachers in high school were like football coaches who just could have cared less about history. And history is actually really fascinating, but not when you have a football coach who's asleep, not caring about the subject matter. Oh, absolutely. I hear that all the time where I'll do a presentation and it's for the kids, but then afterwards the adults or the parents come up and they're like, I wish you were my teacher and it's, it's the biggest compliment because you know you connected with them for the first time or maybe the second time they've they've seen how chemistry and science is exciting and how it explains the world around you and so I just I love those moments when people say I would be there you know it would have been nice for me to be their teacher sure so I want to read what I read your thesis was on uh, it said direct comparison of homogeneous and heterogeneous palladium catalyst for Suzuki Mayora cross coupling reactions. You got a lot of those words right. Good job. <laughs> what does that even mean? That can't be English, right? <laughs> You know what's funny um, is after I wrote my dissertation, and so I, I have a PhD in inorganic chemistry, and so after I wrote my dissertation, it was 400 pages, I, I sent it to my mom, and I remember thinking, perfect, like she's going to understand everything, now she gets what I've been talking about, and she called me in like tears laughing, <laughs> and she was like, Katie, I don't know what any of these words mean, and I was just so stumped, and it was really the first time I realized that like, I, there's a language, we've learned a different language, and we right. speak a different language when we talk about chemistry and science in particular. Um, so to answer your question, in the simple terms, I designed one molecule that was really good at bringing two other molecules together. So I made carbon-carbon bonds um, in a process that was really common in pharmaceuticals, so a lot in drug making, um, specifically for medicine. Okay, all right. So how did you go from that <laughs> to, <laughs> to blowing things up on TV? Well, in graduate school, so I got my PhD here at the University of Texas. Um, in graduate school, I had to teach, I had to TA, um, and I worked for a professor, Professor Alan Cowley, who has since passed away, but I miss him a lot. He was an excellent mentor, and he was very old school, and he really wanted you to teach every single semester that you were in graduate school. Okay. And that's quite unorthodox. Like, right now, the current policy is you teach two semesters out of your five years, and so I taught for 15 semesters, and so it was 
significant. And so what I learned is that I love teaching and I did not like being trapped in a lab where there were not very many windows and the people were very awkward. Um, and I just <laughs> loved being um, outside and you know on stage, really, I love right. to perform. And so very quickly I loved to, uh, tutoring. Um, I realized that I loved doing review sessions mm -hmm. when we had 500 students in the classroom and I was able to help them get ready for their exam. I just, I loved that. And so that's what led me to teaching. And so I became a professor here at the University of Texas, and so I teach general chemistry. There's two semesters, so the first semester is Gen Chem 1, second semester is Gen Chem 2, and about, I don't know, two months into working at UT, I went to my boss and I was like, I'm bored. I am so <laughs> bored. I have so much energy. I'm not running a research group. Like, I need something else to do, and so we came up with this idea called Fun with Chemistry. Right. It's my outreach program, and I would go out to local Austin schools and just blow stuff up and try to get kids excited about science. And it turns out if you wear designer heels and you breathe fire and you're a chick, uh, people pay attention. Yeah, it turns and so, out. <laughs> and so I started doing some stuff on TV and it really just went from like, I like teaching, I like fire, let's see what we can do with this. And We Are Austin was kind of the original spot that you would go, oh, right? I'm big fans of We Are Austin. Big fans of We Are Austin, yes. No, anybody in here from that? Okay, no, but we <laughs> love them a big time. Yeah, they started me. I was there for another person's event. We were promoting he called it a boring science lecture and he was like Kate will you come and do something exciting to do like jazz up my lecture and yeah. I was like sure you know I'd never been TV on TV before this was 2014 I thought that would be really fun and so I went we did the experiment it worked perfectly and afterwards the manager of CBS Austin who's still there you probably interacted yeah. with her she came charging in and she was like that was awesome do you do anything <laughs> for Halloween and I was like yes I do I can make pumpkins vomit I can make them explode, I can do this, this, and this. And she literally just went, shh, 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 sure, come back. Right. And so <laughs> I came back, you know her, and she's like, she's very chill, but she's like a perfect Dallas woman, like totally together, and just, right. I was too much for her at the moment. Um, but anyway, she invited me back for Thanksgiving, and then for New Year's, and before I knew it, I had a, we a monthly segment on We Are Austin. And so for four years, I went to We Are Austin, to that studio right here, yep. and I would do science experiments and try to get our community excited about science and it was awesome and I'm very grateful because for four years they taught me the process. Sure. They told me how the cameras work, what the teleprompters are like, what they're listening for in their ears. And so even though I was just there to do science experiments, I was truly learning and being an intern and learning the process of TV and the TV magic. Now, how did this turn into going on Colbert and when, <laughs> didn't you blow up Wendy Williams' birthday cake or something? I did, <laughs> yes, I did blow up her birthday cake. That was so fun. I, when people ask me what my research is, that's one of the things I cite. It's like, well, I had to figure out how to blow up Wendy Williams' birthday cake and that was like, I had to put significant time into that oh, and it worked awesome. It was really cool. Um, but. The tr like the truth, I'll tell you the real story since we're all friends here. Yeah. Um, I had a margarita and the, after the beginning of all good stories. <laughs> Um, but I'd had a margarita and I'd watched this this ad it had come on TV and it was for Girls Inc which is this excellent program in Houston they support girls who are into STEM and uh, they they were like come join us be part of us and I was like I would love to be part of Girls Inc so I wrote this beautiful drunk email and I sent it to Girls Inc I was like we should partner like I do this you do this we will be best friends and I copied and pasted it and sent it to every other girls organization across the country right and within 20 minutes Amy Poehler smart girls got back to me. So Amy Poehler's real best friend, Meredith Walker, lives here in Austin. Amy Poehler Smart Girls is an organization here in Austin, and they feature girls who are smart. And to be smart, by their definition, is you have a brain and you use it. So everybody is considered to be a smart girl. Yeah. And so I partnered with them. They came to campus. I worked with them. We shot like 20 videos. They were here for three days, and I got amazing feedback. I mean, it's Amy Poehler. Right. I got amazing feedback on what to do, what not to do, how to stand in front the camera and more importantly how to talk about the science in an interesting way and then that got some publicity it led to some more national stuff and then in 2018 I got this call he's from New York but he lives in LA so it's like a very interesting accent and he was like I think you're gonna be the next Bill Nye come out to LA and I was like I don't know I don't know like I don't know 
but there was just something about his voice, and he talked me into it. I'm still working with him to this day. Glenn, I love you. Um, but he called me up. He convinced me to go to L.A. I flew out there. It was right around this time, so okay. during spring break, and so I could take a week off uh, from the university. Flew out to L.A. I refused to get in a car with him because I'd heard all those like terrible stories about how you know, you're going to get kidnapped by the guy in the L.A. So I was like, I'm not doing that. And right. so I just got another car. We would drive everywhere. We'd need two parking spots. And they were like, you didn't come together? It's like, nope. And we just continued on. But by the end of the week, um, I had signed him as a manager. I'd signed United Talent Agency as my agency. And so I left with like 21 agents and a manager. And I was doing this whole Hollywood dream. And I had no idea what I was doing. Right. Um, but that was that's how it started. The thing I've started to learn is nobody has any idea what they're doing. Yes. I mean, even when they get famous, but certainly not leading up to that point, which is sort of encouraging to hear. Absolutely. I always tell my students, like, I was, I'm a small town girl from Michigan. I'm from Portage, Michigan, which is a suburb of the big city Kalamazoo, which you probably have never heard of. And so I was never, ever planning on being on TV. That was never the plan. I was going to be a scientist. I was going to cure cancer. Like, that is what I told all of my aunts and uncles for years. And now, all of a sudden, I had these opportunities that I wasn't planning on, and I just kept saying yes. Yeah. It sounded like fun. And so I tell my students that all the time. If it's any way directly related to what you're doing and it sounds like fun, you've got to go after it. Just say yes. Life is so short. We learned that with COVID. You have to go after your dreams. Yeah. For International Women's Day, someone had asked, what advice have you learned that stuck with you? And Amy, not Amy Poehler, you got Amy Poehler on the right. <laughs> Tina Fey <laughs> had said, when someone asks you to do something and you're like, am I smart enough for this? Am I prepared for this? Am I ready for this? Just say yes and you'll figure it out afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that has stuck with me, not only professionally, but on a personal level too. It's such great advice. I completely agree with that. Yeah, if it sounds like fun and related to what you do, do it. Just I mean, say, yes. say yes. Nobody else is prepared either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's take a question real quick. Now, I'll tell you guys, if you go into the South By app and select this session, this session and then do engage, you can ask a question for us. I'm the least tech savvy person on earth, so <laughs> hopefully that will work. But somebody asked, I watched Magic School Bus growing up and it was really instrumental in my love. Oh, where did it go? Oh, here it is. I, I watched Magic School Bus growing up and it was really instrumental in my love of science. What role does TikTok and other socials play in doing the same? Oh, that is a good question. So TikTok is my biggest platform, and I've got to tell you, I never thought that was going to be the case. My agents called me in, and they're like, you got to get on TikTok. Like, you need to do this. It's, it's really easy to give um, your experiment, put your experiments out there, get people excited about science. And then they hooked me in. They're like, and you can correct the bad science. And I was like, all right, I'm out there. I got to go. I got to try it. Um, so on TikTok, I have like 200,000 followers, something like that. And it's just, it's so much fun because my my followers, I hate saying that, but my friends, we'll just put it that way, will submit questions and I can answer them. I can answer their questions about science. I can debunk bad science or I can just answer things they're curious about. Like, is aspartame bad for you? How does coffee work? Things like that. Yeah. Um, and so I think what's really neat about TikTok is that there's an algorithm and depending on what you like, you can get more videos. And so my personal feed is full of science videos right. and all these different fun experiments. I'm learning so much from other creators and I'm also learning about fields just a little bit outside of chemistry. So I follow a lot of biologists and physicists. I'm a lot of people that are astrophysicists. And I love learning these little nuggets, like this like one, one little fact here, one little fact here, really quickly when I'm on my break, when I need a mental health break. For some reason, learning science is where I go. <laughs> I love that. I wish I had a more intelligent mental health break, but I appreciate that. That's embarrassing. Sure. Let me say something else. I also work out and make cookies, so I'm a little <laughs> bit more well-rounded. Very well-rounded. I love it. Uh, tell me about your class at UT. Well, first of all, during the pandemic, you had to teach remote, correctly? Yes, Co correct. Remotely, correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. <laughs> uh, that had to be difficult for you when you're all about the energy and blowing things up and, it was and running around miserable. the classroom. It was miserable. How did you make that work? Oh, a lot of wine after after class. No, not true. But a little <laughs> bit, a little bit. It was rough for me because I like to move around. I'm struggling right now sitting in this chair because usually when I'm on stage, I'm pacing back and forth and right. I like fire this, liquid nitrogen that. Um, and so I really struggled with the teaching online because it was one webcam and I had to stand still. I got used to it, but in the beginning, my students were like, Dr. B, you're off camera. And I'm right. like, right, sorry. And I like come <laughs> back because I'm just sprinting like, around the room. Exactly. Yeah. 
But on the other side, what was really cool is I was able to interact with a lot more people than I was orig originally expecting to. Um, I started networking with people all across the country and internationally. Yeah. I did some presentations with Hong Kong, which I thought was really cool. They would translate what I was saying Very live. Cool. It was really cool. And so it gave me a, a chance to interact with people I would have never been able to interact with before. And then obviously, anytime I'm sharing science, I love that. And so yeah. that makes me very happy. But what's cool is that I could do experiments and then pick them up to the webcam and then little kids could ask questions about what they're seeing right there. Yeah. And so if they were in my audience, sometimes they're really far in the back and they can't see as well as when I do things with a webcam. So there were some positives with it and I eventually learned how to do it properly. But that first like two months was just, I was trapped in a house with my husband who I love, but it was just <laughs> the two of us and a webcam. And I was like, oh my God. Like, yes. Everyone was here. either like devastatingly lonely or like my spouse is driving me <laughs> crazy and my children are driving me crazy right. and you were on one side or the other. Well, and I'm an extreme extrovert. So I want to talk about everything I see, every thought in my head. I want to tell you about it. Let's talk about it. My husband is an extreme introvert. He loves to read. He has this Kindle. I call it his emotional support Kindle. And so he has it with him at all times. And so when that comes out, I know he needs a break. And so I have to take my extrovert away a little bit. And yes. Him a yeah. Well, we were talking backstage about how during the pandemic, I went through a breakup and I'm an extrovert too. I go out probably six, seven nights a week. And I'm like, how do I feel better? What do I do? And on social media, it had said, here's how you get a boost of dopamine. Here's how you get a boost of serotonin. And for oxytocin, it said pet puppies, pet dogs. So I would go to my sister's house and just pet her dogs. And it really did make me feel so much better. Well, that science is accurate. It's 100% accurate. I write about that in my book. It's Elemental, The Hidden Chemistry for Everything, available anywhere <laughs> books are sold. Um, but it's, that's my, in that book, it's a, I write about the science of the busiest day of your life. So I start with breakfast, and then all the way go, go all the way down to date night. Um, and in my date night chapter is actually when I talk about oxytocin. And so you get very big spikes of oxytocin during sex, right? Date right. night, you get at that. But you also get it uh, for women. The highest count in your body is during childbirth. Um, so you have 300 times the amount of oxytocin you'll have in your body than you will any other time in your life because you want to love what just did that to you. Um, and so that's why <laughs> the molecules come shooting in your body to make you love the baby. Um, but outside of those two, the last thing is literally there's a lot of research showing that if you have a puppy crawl into your lap, like you need to physically interact with it. It's not the same as seeing it, but if you physically interact with a puppy or a kitten or any animal that you think is cute, yeah. um, you see a spike in oxytocin. And sometimes you get a little bit of dopamine there, but in general, it, it, it makes you happier. So if you want to feel better, either pet a puppy, have sex, or give birth. Or give birth. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure that's 100% what the research is. Choose does. your yes. own adventure, but it will make you feel better. <laughs> Tell us some other fun things about science. I remember you talked about caffeine uh, in yeah. your book. Yeah. yeah, so caffeine is a molecule trimethylxanthine, and what it does is it actually goes into your brain, and it binds with your brain in a way where it blocks this other molecule, adenosine, from binding with your brain. So adenosine is the molecule that makes you feel sleepy. And so what caffeine actually does is it blocks adenosine from making you feel sleepy. So caffeine doesn't make you feel excited or give you energy. It stops you from feeling sleepy. So it's like a bouncer in your brain. Yeah. And so I like to talk about all those things again in the book, but just in, in general, because you see chemistry everywhere. A lot of you drank trimethylxanthine this morning. You probably didn't know that, I but did. you did. Did you? Yeah, sure. Yeah. OK, see, there you go. And so all that did was try to block adenosine. It's like hunting for adenosine. It's like, get out of here. You're not coming in today. But I like that you make it approachable and fun. There's another thing I've seen on social media where someone put, what's a book that made you cry? And it was like introduction to organic chemistry. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, when I think of science, I, I, you know, people often think of like, it's difficult. It's confusing. I don't know what they're talking about. And you really lay it out in a way where it's actually fun and approachable. I try to. I mean, that's the goal. My chemistry teacher did that for me. I mean, she took chemistry chemistry, a subject you can't see, and now I swear I can see it. I can think in atoms, I can think in molecules, I swear I can see that. And I'm just trying to do that for my students, make them see it. Yeah. And so I'm a visual person. I don't know if you're familiar with different learning strategies, but VARK is one of the very common ones. So V-A-R-K. V is visual, A is oral, read, R is reading, and K is kinesthetic. And so you can do these surveys online. It's like a 12-question quiz, and it will tell you how you learn. And so I learn from 
visual and kinesthetic. Surprise, surprise, I do experiments to show chemistry, sure. right? Um, and so I like to use that in my classroom and bring it forward. And I totally lost what the question was, but because I got excited. Uh, about I don't part, know. But... <laughs> We're not sticking to any formats here. Let's take a audience question. So have you ever had an experiment go wrong? Yes. So many times I've had experiments go wrong. Um, I can tell you about the worst one. And so I, when it was first getting started, maybe like 2015, so I'd had maybe like six months under my belt. I had known just enough to get hurt. Um, so I was doing this experiment where I light hydrogen balloons on fire, and so it's just like a little poof, like a little firework. Um, but if you spike it with magnesium or maybe uh, strontium or sodium or copper, you can give the color and so turn it into like a colorful firework. And so what I like to do is tie four of those together. So you've got a red, a green, a sparkly one, maybe a little pink in there, yeah. set all four of those on fire, and it's this beautiful, like, big explosion firework. And so what I do is you just take a blowtorch, and you just kind of stick your arm in there, and you pull it back real fast, no problem, if you're wearing a lab coat. Um, <laughs> and so I was doing a photo shoot, because I was young and stupid, and I was like, yeah, I don't need the lab coat, I'll just move it really fast, um, no big deal. You do need a lab coat, you do, because um, I burned my arm. Luckily, the fire just, like, traveled up my arm. It didn't hurt me too badly, except for one spot. I had a ponytail holder around my wrist, and you can still see the scar. Now, to be fair, that's a two scars on top of each other. I've burned myself tw there twice. Um, but <laughs> I had a ponytail holder there, and the fire got trapped under it and basically melted the plastic to my skin, and that did not feel good. Um, and I was working with this guy, Eric Wigdahl. Love you, Eric, if you're listening, um, because he immediately dumped burn cream all over my arm but we got an awesome picture, so oh my it was worth it. Well, now any, I'll say it was worth it. For photo, right? Anything for anything the photo, right? Anything for the photo. for the gram? Or yes, but if there, are, if there are any kids listening anywhere, please don't do that. Wear your goggles, gloves, and lab coat. Like, that was a big mistake. I should not have done that. I'm still <laughs> laughing that they paired the two of us together yeah. because anyone who knows me knows I'm terrified of fire. And, and of I'm course, like, you literally have fire. pyromaniac in your bio. It's funny, though. My sister, I was talking about being afraid of fire, and my sister was like, of course you're afraid of fire. And I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, well, think of all the times you accidentally set yourself on fire as a child. I'm like, what? Yeah. Apparently, I blew out my birthday cake, leaned in, oh, no. set my hair on fire, fell into a campfire. You know, it's those childhood, those childhood trauma things that, that'll get you. But I do love watching your experiments, you know, from, from afar. From afar. <laughs> at least, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about STEM education and women. Like, you are obviously leading the vanguard on that. What are some things that you want to see change? Well, I mean, like it or not, I do represent women in STEM. So when I go on TV, I, I am a woman. I represent women in STEM. And so I try to lean into my feminine side. I'm not a super feminine person, but in the chemistry world, I'm 100% feminine, right? <laughs> like, I stand out. I yes. wear the heels. Like, you know, I wear the skirts, the whole thing. Um, but I try to lean into that a little bit more than I normally do when I'm on TV and when I'm on stage because I want to break the mold just a little bit. I want to show that anybody can be a scientist. It doesn't matter who you are, who you love, what you look like, as long as you have a question, you are a scientist. And so when I'm on stage, I try to kind of put that persona out there. But I also am hoping that we can break the mold even more. I mean, let's be honest, I'm a straight white girl. And so it would be really cool to get some LGBTQ communities, some women of color. I mean, right now, I don't know if you guys know this, but there have been 634 Nobel Prizes handed out in science. 34 of those have been to women, 34 out of the 634. And and one was to a woman of color, one. We have to change that. We have to change those numbers. Like that is, that's disgusting. Yeah. Um, I was in Houston presenting those numbers to a group of inner, inner city students and they were outraged. And I was like, all right, I've got a hundred pissed off girls. Like, let's that's go. That's what we want. Exactly, we want yes. people mad. I want them mad. And so I'm hoping that we can change those numbers. And so when we have those, those little um, activities that we give to young kids and it says draw a scientist, you know, originally 10, 15, 15 years ago, they always drew Bill Nye. That's essentially who they would draw. Okay. And so now it's changing. You're seeing more women. You're seeing, you know, the, a girl in a lab coat. And so hopefully in, you know, more 10, 15 years, they're going to be drawing everybody. Every single person will be represented. In I that. love that. That's and do you think the pandemic helped at least peak interest? It's amazing how interesting science is when, when the world shuts down and, and life depends on it. Yes, completely. I think yes and no. I mean, there was an obvious battle against 
science. I'm here in right. Texas especially, right? We're right. not going to go into that, but there was definitely some anti-science uh, conversations sure. happening. On the other side, though, my book, the bestseller, The Big Book of Experiments, available on Amazon and everywhere books are sold, um, that book <laughs> came out right after the pandemic really hit here in, in the United States. So about three weeks after everything shut down, my book came out. Okay. And so because of that, when parents had been stuck with their kids for about three weeks at that point, they were at a breaking point, they all reached for this book. And so it was 25 experiments that kids could do at home with stuff that hopefully they already have in their drawers, in their pantries, their craft drawer. And so I think that really helped push towards science because there was just this book of activities sitting there that parents could do to educate their kids when they weren't actually in the classroom. Yeah. So, I mean, it went both ways. I think parents right. were really trying to keep that education going for a while there. I think they got burnt out, which I don't blame them at all. Sure. But I also think there was an anti-science conversation. And so I'm more motivated than ever to get out there and right. turn scientists into heroes. Well, at least the, ki the kiddos, the youngsters, I think, were curious. And curiosity is obviously key. Oh, for, for this. sure. Yeah, 100%. For everything. So let's take another question. Let's see. In a scientific answer, how exactly does caffeine work with... Oh, we're, oh, they keep doing that where they bump it up. In a scientific answer, how exactly does caffeine work with an ADHD brain since it sometimes has the opposite effect? You know, honestly, I don't know the answer to that. There's a, a lot of research out there. I don't know if they know 100% as well because your brains do work differently. What I will tell you is caffeine, the molecule trimethylxanthine, binds with a very specific receptor. And so my guess is be, with ADHD brain chemistry, there's something where that receptor is messed with, maybe it's bound with another chemical, maybe something else is going on, but trimethylxanthine is trying to hit one specific receptor, and so it's, it's got to do with that. Okay, mm -hmm. got it. Let's talk about Bill Nye. Okay. So you grew up watching him, I right? did, yes. Um, have, you, have you met him? Have you chatted with him? I have, yes. So I'm really fortunate. My manager, Glenn, used to work with Bill Nye, um, and so they have a very friendly relationship. So anytime I need something, I can reach out to him. We can chat about things. Um, I'm now part of a little circle that I'm like geeking out about. So Bill Nye, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and myself all kind of forward some things around together a little okay. bit. Not much. It's only happened a couple times, but that's enough for it to count, and yeah. I'm going to like die happy because of it. Sure. Um, but I am now like the little chemistry person in their circle. So if they get approached for, a, you know, an, an interview with somebody on national news and it's too much chemistry, they don't know the answer, it, they push it to me. And so that, that feels really neat that I'm at least... I'm at least in their circle a little bit. They value my intellect. And so I just never thought the guy that I was raised on would think that I could answer some questions that he can't. Yeah. It's like my teachers would push the TV into our room. Like that's how old I am. And then they'd push the VCR <laughs> in and they'd put the tape in and we'd watch Bill Nye. And I mean, I'm from this small town. We didn't have a lot of amazing scientists that would come into our classroom and talk about science. And so it was just an invaluable experience for me to be able to like see Bill Nye on the TV as a fifth grader and then go to my book launch and he was interviewing me for my official launch when my book went out there for It's Elemental and like and he didn't even charge me like he's a cool guy he could have charged me I feel like a bajillion dollars and he did it for free like that's how cool of a guy he is and how supportive he he is for the next generation of scientists that's and nice. like I'm taking notes things that he does I'm like okay this is how it's done this is how you support future scientists and so I'm just learning yeah. a lot from him pay that forward exactly. for sure you have to now were other other than Mrs. Powell's Rock, were there any famous female scientists that you followed? Not really on TV, I yeah, guess. Yeah, there aren't really that many on TV. I will say my generation is doing an excellent job of getting out there. Right. I'm a huge fan of the space gal, Emily. Um, if you have, if you want to find new people to look at, I love her. She's excellent. Um, I also love the physics girl, Diana. She's actually suffering from long COVID right now, has some horrific symptoms. Yeah, it's very sad. She's had a health scare. So if you're a fan of the physics girl at all, send her some love. Um, we are all trying to support her as much as we can because she's one of our big girls we need her to stick around right yeah definitely tell me about your new podcast that's coming out 
next month? Is that right? Oh, yes, the first episode drops in April. Y'all, this is like a dream job for me. So NPR, NPR. It's huge. <laughs> I know. NPR is doing a new science podcast called Seeking a Scientist, and they auditioned a bunch of hosts. I fought tooth and nail for it, and I can't believe they gave it to me. So I'm the new host. I'm so excited. Or the host, I should say. I keep yeah. saying new host. I'm the only host. It's yeah. just me. Um, and it is my dream job because I am getting to turn scientists into rock stars. And so we're doing these episodes about science that is like one step outside of what you normally hear in everyday media. Yeah. So for example, our first episode is about aging and all this fascinating research that's going on. Did you guys know they can set the age of the heart back by 10 years? They can do that. And they have research to do that right now. Yeah. And so they're- What does that even on, mean? It's on my, you can live longer. You get 10 more years if your heart's failing. What's the science? What's like the elevator pit? I mean, I know- The elevator gonna to, We're going to listen to the podcast. They in, they inject something into a mouse and it went an older mouse and it resets their heart by 10 years. So for example, if they were only able to run on a treadmill, there's like mouse treadmills. If they were only able to run just a tiny bit, they now can run marathon runners as geriatric mice. Um, so it's, it's like, it's unbelievable, the science that's happening. One guy can restore the vision in geriatric mice completely, so you restart it. Yeah. Um, so it's all about taking, it's usually stem cells, into your body, and then you can regenerate and go through tissue homeostasis. It's like the coolest thing ever. And then we have another episode that's on trash islands and all the crazy ecosystems yeah. that's happening and forming there and how like it's just new science happening because of trash in the ocean. Um, and so I get to talk about all these cool researchers and ask them about their science, and their, it's like the best thing in the world because you never get to do that. You I can tell you're not excited about this I know. at all. So it's like, <laughs> it's so exciting. Our first episode drops. It's called Seeking a Scientist, and it's on NPR. Our website launched yesterday, so if you just Google Seeking a Scientist, you'll be able to get the website, and then it should pop up in your podcast in the next couple weeks. I love it. All right, tell us something cool about a cool topic. Like, give us some scientific insight on, like, sex or drugs oh, or God. something. Well, I can tell you, I'll tell you a funny story about drugs. How about Hear that? It. Okay. Um, so I've partnered with Wired, the magazine, the digital magazine, um, for a number of different things. But one of my favorite things is when they asked me to explain meth because they wanted to figure out if the science on Breaking Bad was accurate. Okay. And I was like, I've never done meth. I don't actually know, but I do know science. And so I pulled up all the videos and I was watching them and Googling and watching them and Googling. And after about three hours, I feel like I could make meth. I really truly feel like I could do <laughs> Do this. It's not that hard if you can get your hands on the right stuff and you know the proper techniques. It's dangerous. It's very dangerous, so be careful. But afterwards, at, like as I was going to sleep, I was like, I bet I'm, all, I'm on all the lists now. Like all that Google searching, 100% is triggered. So if I wasn't on the FBI, the CIA, what all the lists are, I definitely <laughs> right. am now. But the show does a good job. The veracity is there. Excellent job. Excellent. I mean, it looks fantastic. It really looks like they're making meth. I mean, that's somebody's job, right? Yeah. Being the science yeah. correspondent, telling them, like, no, do this, don't do this. And it was. They did. They had a science uh, consultant yes. on, on set. I will say meth isn't supposed to be blue, but I think everybody knows that about Breaking Bad. They did that to make sure it looked a little different. Yeah. Um, but now on the streets, well, in, well, not probably not now, but when it was popular, when the show was popular, people were adding copper to the meth to give it that blue color um, and you're just, you shouldn't do that you're not supposed to smoke it I don't even know how you do meth smoke it <laughs> whatever you do you're not supposed to put copper in your body in that way got it got it what about sex any interesting I don't know facts tidbits sure. things people don't know I mean I'm sure there's there are a lot of different facts about it I mean men typically have a couple spikes right after their orgasm so it's scientifically why they take a nap it's not because they're a bad partner they're like their hormones are going over, what's the over spike and like, what's the hormone I can't think of okay. it right now yeah but it's it spikes and then they like completely crash out whereas with women we have that oxytocin boost so we're all like we're in like, love and exactly yeah. and it's it's all like um uh evolutionary driven sure. right because I mean we could have then just been, become pregnant and so it's in our best interest to now partner up with somebody who can then help us if we do produce a child have offspring because yeah. now we have a unit and hopefully your partner can then help you with you know money and, and other <laughs> right. things like protecting you from an, another aggressive male or something and I mean it's interesting how things become so progressive but also we're all wired a certain way oh, too yeah. 
You know, it's oh, that delicate balance. Yeah, there's hormones. I mean, there's molecules in your body that are dictating everything that you're doing. They're driving you in, in, in all these different directions. There's no pheromones, though. That is a big misconception. Is it? Okay. Yeah, humans, humans don't have pheromones. We haven't detected them yet. Some people are convinced, some scientists are convinced that we're going to find pheromones in humans, but I think that's crap. I really don't think that's going to happen now. Um, main, the main reason why is because we communicate. We can actually speak to each other. Yeah. So a lot of times pheromones occur because the species can't communicate and so okay. they need to use pheromones which are molecules that go out of your body and then they're basically hormones that interact on someone else and so my pheromones would be hormones that I give off that you then take in that's so, what pheromones so there's nothing to the oyster champagne nope. all crap strawberry okay. nope. <laughs> it is all crap I so mean, they're very seductive they in their are. own right exactly but, yeah but it, it has to do with things like think about you know I've had oysters with my husband and that's resulted in certain activities and I've also had oysters with my boss and like no activity right. zero right yeah. and I'm not even charged up at that point and so it has to do with who you're with and you know how that mood is and how you are communicating sure. but how did these myths get started and perpetuated I always blame men but that's probably not fair <laughs> <laughs> right here we'll go with it. <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. All right, let's take another. Okay. Speaking of mm -hmm. tips for having confidence when you're in a male dominated field. Oh, that's tricky. That's definitely tricky. So I have kind of a very strong personality. So I don't put up with anything. And so when I walk into a room, I kind of have two approaches. My first thing is that I want to do my best at sounding intelligent. I mean, the truth be told, I work in a male-dominated field. There are a lot of them are older than me, and I look the way I look, and I walk in, and I'm loud. Um, and so what my strategy is, is my first three sentences when I'm meeting someone new, especially when they're an intellectual, they're in academia, my science needs to be on point. Like I need, I wait until right. I'm very confident with my science that I know what I'm saying is accurate and then I say it confidently. After I get past that first three sentences or so, I kind of let myself go and relax and be my authentic self. Um, that's something I learned back in 2016 when I partnered with Amy Poehler. Her organization's motto is be your authentic self. Just be who you are. There's right. nothing wrong with that. And so I really took that to heart and I use that in those meetings. The second piece is a little bit more superficial, but I try to look my best. You yeah. know, I, I do. I try not to look like a slouch. I want to make sure I, I've put time into my effort and I show that I care about the meeting right. um, in the same way where if my students show up and they're in sweats and they smell like weed, I'm less likely to give them an extension. But if they're like dressed up and they're crying hysterically and they're telling me, you know, their sob story, I'm more likely to be on their side. Yeah. And so, right, you just, you got to use your assets and do the best you can to do a, a good impression. And yeah. I love me, that you, you utilize your assets, but you're also going to prove that you're smart as well. There's such a weird misconception. I feel like I get that a lot because I'm blonde and I go out all the time and I love to dance and I like going to parties. But you're a brilliant writer. She's an amazing writer. If you guys haven't read any of her stuff, you have to check it out. I need to just fangirl over her for a second. She's oh, you're excellent. so sweet. Well, we both went to UT and I was valedictorian of, the gradu of my graduating class in the communications school, but I'm also a blonde who right. likes to go to parties right. and likes to have fun and the idea that somehow you couldn't be stunning and presentable, but also this brilliant scientist is just absurd to me. So I love it's that you absurd. lean into both. Yeah, you have to. I mean, I do. I, I'm a, my authentic self. This is who I am. I love heels. That's my mom's fault. She loves heels. I um, see those red bottom I, heels. I love, like, okay. I love them. But my mom, so we're from Michigan and we're Dutch. And so my mom loved clogs. So she had all the different colored clogs growing up. And like, I thought it was totally normal that my mom was wearing hot pink clogs everywhere. And it just <laughs> not what other moms do. But because of her, I love shoes. I love heels and love colorful heels. And so I just kind of have leaned into different pieces. But in the same vein, my mom is an extremely strong woman. People yeah. do not mess with her. My dad has this big group of friends. They're extraordinarily close, and every single one of them had a prank on them at their wedding, except for my dad, because they were terrified of my mother, um, because they knew she was just a fierce woman and wasn't going to put up with it. And, so, you, and your whole family is in medicine, right? Uh, all... Psychologists. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we like to. They like to talk about their feelings. I don't like to talk about my feelings. <laughs> I want to see the data and then we're going to analyze it. And I don't really care how you feel about it. And then blow it up, right? <laughs> and they'll blow it up. Speaking of, okay, somebody asked, what's the deal with that stuff on the side table next to you? Ooh, Should I have an experiment. Bring it out? Do you want to do it? Let's do it. Okay. So I brought something for her because I thought it would be fun. Um, 
like I said before, I got a very stern warning, no fire, nothing dangerous. So this is innocuous. Um, so here I'm gonna have you take this first. Okay. So that's calcium chloride. I've given her 10 grams of calcium chloride. You don't need gloves for this part yet. Here, I'll take your mic. Okay, okay. I'll put it over here. All right, so now you're going to open this and put your water into that one. So you're gonna combine those two. I just gave you those two bottles. Perfect, okay, so she's got food grade calcium chloride. Do you want me to open that for you? Okay, <laughs> we're working together. Okay, there you go. So 10 grams of calcium chloride. Okay, tell me what I'm doing now. Just dump the water into the other one. Yeah, perfect. I'm not doing this really it's okay, way. it's all right, we're gonna make it work. So yes, and so this is an experiment that I learned back in 2018 because I agreed to go to an event at John Hopkins Camp Sunrise. And so quick trigger warning, I'm gonna talk about kids with cancer and then shake it, so do that and then shake it up for me and then shake, shake, shake for a second. So I went to John Hopkins Camp Sunrise and Camp Sunrise is a camp with kids with terminal cancer. And so they were basically all kids who had a very short life expectancy and they asked me to come to this camp and distract them with science. And after I signed the contract, easy yes, right? They were like, by the way, no fire, no liquid nitrogen, don't dry ice, nothing, nothing fun. And I was like, what am I gonna do? Like, what can I do? Because they banned me from everything. So once you're ready, you can jump it in there. Don't dump it in the beaker. Okay. And so um, I had to do some brainstorming and think about what I could possibly do for this group to make sure that I could entertain them but still make it safe. Because what's cool about this is they had kids with backpacks that had chemo in it and it was giving them their chemo while they were doing science with me. Like so cool. Okay, so now I've got these things over here. So I've got red and green and blue. You have two hands so you can pick. Which okay. one do you want? Do you want that one? Okay, good. And then go ahead and just squirt them right in there. Yep. And so okay. this is, just squeeze, oh, I <laughs> squeeze. So these are sodium alginate solutions. And so sodium alginate is um, extracted from algae, which is extracted from brown seaweed. That's good, oh, yeah, you good. can do more if you want to. Okay. And so what I did here is just dissolved it in some water, and then now we're letting our two species mix. And so I'll take these from you. Now, do you wanna get your hands wet or do you want a glove? Okay, cool, I like that. All right, so now what we're gonna do is you have to count to 10, so we, but we're probably at five now, so one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, good enough. So go ahead and stick your hand in there and pull out and show them what you made. Isn't that cool? Okay, so now gummy worms? you made gummy worms, so let me kind of have a long one here. Okay. Isn't that cool? Wait, and can we actually Yeah, use? it's gross though. <laughs> I got it from in my eye. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. Oh, you're brave. <laughs> what do you think? Okay. It's not sugary. It's not sugary yeah. at all. No, not at all. Here, let me give you your mic back. The t yeah. The texture is there. Mm -hmm. How cool. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so what, what just happened? Let me explain. Okay, so what we did with these kids is I had them make the sodium alginate solution, we had to make the calcium chloride, and then they all were able to make gummy worms. And so what gummy worms are is a cross-polymerization reaction. And so you essentially take um, something that showed up as sodium alginate and then calcium chloride and you do an ion exchange. And so you swap them. And so it ended up being alginate calcium, alginate calcium, and it just repeats over and over and over again. So if you picture in your brain one of those paperclip necklaces, it has repeating units, it kind of looks like that. And so here what we made is called a gel. And so it's a liquid trapped inside of another liquid. And this is exactly how you make Make gummy worms. Isn't that cool? Fascinating. So now to make them taste good, because right. that was not good. <laughs> I mean, it was cool. I wouldn't eat it for fun. No, no. I have to eat these about every week, so I get used to it. But um, to, to make them taste good, what you can do is you dissolve the sodium alginate in watermelon puree, and then you add like six buckets of sugar, and then that's how the people actually make the okay, gummy worms. Got it. But got if you, it. I don't know if you got a big chunk, but they're kind of more like a gusher, because it's a liquid in a liquid. And so if you yes. bite down on it, the liquid shoots out and you okay. end up with that really fun um, texture. That makes you want to know more about sugar because I think of sugar as sort of a drug in its own right. True. Any, any fun, interesting science facts with that? I mean, it's a carbohydrate. Um, it's delicious. I... <laughs> Is there any reason some people, like my parents are the biggest sugar eaters. I know I don't crave sugar really. Would well, there be any reason? Because genetically you would, think you would think that I would like sugar if both of them love it so much. Well, okay. So it's tricky because as soon as we introduce taste to something, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of mind chemistry 
chemistry, brain chemistry okay. that's going on. And so the way our brain interprets something is gonna be totally different than the way your brain interprets something, okay. even though the chemistry is relatively similar because there's an emotional piece that kind of lands in there. Okay. So for example, I love rhubarb pie. That is my favorite it's pie. My I'm mom. obsessed with it. I'm a classic Midwesterner. Like yeah, rhubarb same, yeah. grows as a weed in Michigan. Like it is what it is. Um, down here, by the way, it's like seven bucks a pound. And I'm like, it's free up there. It's a weed, just ship it to me. But anyway, um, so I love rhubarb pies. And I'm pretty sure the reason why is because my mom makes rhubarb pies. I'm, right. I almost guarantee that it was the first pie I ever had. It was the first time I had that sugary, gooey deliciousness. And yeah. so I'm partial to that. And so a lot yeah, of the reasons- association. Exactly, sure. yeah. And there's like a nostalgia piece and everything. So a lot of times when you have a favorite food, it's, it's associated to a good, positive experience. Yeah. And it pulls back a memory in the same way that music does. So you might be familiar with that. Um, it's the same type of science. Definitely. All right, let's take another question. What's the science behind how your period can make you severely depressed at the same time every month? And what advice can you give to help combat that? It's hormones. It's all hormones. And so depending on it, if you have birth control, that's going to affect it in a positive or negative way as well. Um, so I am not a medical doctor. My lawyer is very careful about this. <laughs> I got to be careful. So I can't give you any medical advice, but I usually say, talk to your doctor. There are different birth controls you can go on, even if you're not sexually active. And it can absolutely help with either adding hormones or taking hormones away a little bit. And so there's a lot of different options, but talk to your doctor and get a good doctor. If you're not, if your doctor's not listening to you, Try to find a female doctor because a lot of times they're more patient with this particular question. I have a lot of opinions on this and I will say having dealt with a medical issue last year, I was really surprised because I'd, I'd never had any medical issues really my whole life, how quickly doctors would almost kind of gaslight you and almost be like, are you sure this isn't just in your head? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they only do that to women, but from anecdotally what I've heard, that seems to be the case more. So all I will say is advocate for mm -hmm. yourself and don't let any doctor lead you to believe you're crazy. You know your body. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, I mean, from personal experience just here in Austin, I when I moved down here, I got an OBGYN. She was a younger female doctor. I really liked her. I went to get my IUD. We had a horrific experience. She gaslit me. I didn't like it. I ended up finding an, a 70-year-old man, um, OBGYN, and he is my favorite person in yeah. the world. I will not go to anybody else ever. Never in a million years did I think I'd be going to a male gynecologist, but he made me feel comfortable and safe, and he actually listened to me and fixed the problem. Totally. Yeah. And I don't, it isn't gendered. Right. I mean, it can, it can just find the mm -hmm. person who's the right mm -hmm. fit. For exactly. You. Yeah. Just, I love supporting women in medicine. I got to be clear about that. Yes. But like this chick was not good for me. All right. <laughs> let's see. Which question do you want to take of these? Oh, okay. Pick? There's a lot of good ones here. What is your opinion on astrology and how much merit should people put into it? Okay. I love that question, and I want to be very careful about this because my best friend is big into astrology, but there is no science that supports it, but it's very fun. And so I like astrology when I talk to my bestie because she will be like, oh my God, you're such a Gemini, and then spout out some stuff, and I'm like, okay, I think it's just because of this or that, but you know, whatever. <laughs> um, and so I think it's very fun. I have known nothing against it, but I don't believe personally that there is any science to it whatsoever. So you know, take with that what you will. Interesting. I'm crazy into astrology, but it's <laughs> entertainment if nothing else. Thanks. And I always feel like anything that's been around for hundreds or thousands or however long that maybe there's some merit to it, but who knows? I don't have any scientific basis on it. Yes. It is nothing else. It's wildly entertaining. It's wildly entertaining. Okay. We have to talk about that one. It says happy pie day. Yeah. It's March 14th. Happy pie day, you all. <laughs> Let's pie nerd day. out. Very exciting. How will you be celebrating by eating rhubarb pie? Or? You know, I had not even thought about it because I was so preoccupied on just doing this event, yeah. making sure the gummy worms went well. Right. Um, so maybe I will. That sounds delicious. I love it. I love it. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. What tips do you have for scientists to make their research more relevant and interesting to the public? Great oh, question. Jordan, great question. Okay, so science communication is tricky. And I will tell you a story um, and then kind of tell you my advice on it. So I have done a lot of stuff on TV using science, doing different science experiments. And when I went to the Today Show, my very first time, because I didn't know them, I was doing this experiment. It was going to be with four anchors plus Carly Kloss, who was their STEM correspondent, who I love. Yeah, Project Runway fans will know who she is. Um, but she's, she's a model who also is really into supporting women in STEM which is that's her organization, yeah. so that's really cool. Anyway, when I went to do this experiment, you submit your script, you say kind of, this is what I'm planning on saying, this is how the experiment goes, and I'm not kidding.
kidding you, within seconds they were like, I don't think we can do this, I think we need to cancel this segment. And I was like, whoa, 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 why? And they're like, you're talking about um, melonic acid and manganese sulfate, and I was like, well, that's what's in here. And, she, and then they were like, well, could you just say, I mix solution A with solution B and solution C? And I was like, sure, like, fine, okay. Um, and so afterwards I talked to them, and they're shooting for a sixth grade level sixth grade oh, wow. level for science. And so it all has to do with who your audience is. And right. so if you think about who's watching the Today Show, it's parents who are at home with their sick kids, maybe people who are at the dentist's office or the doctor's office, right? So it's on in the background a lot. They're not there for a science lesson. Um, and so I agreed to say solution A and B and C, all well knowing that I was gonna shove the molecule names in there on TV. Like I just can't help myself. Um, and so I waited and I was like, okay, you're gonna mix A and B together and they started stirring and there was like just that second of dead space and I was like by the way there's a little bit of peroxide in there a little bit of this and jumped in and then we moved to the next part and afterwards they're like that was so great that you added the molecule names in there and I was like man like you told me not to and right. now you're complimenting me so there's this delicate balance sure it's really difficult but the biggest thing I will say like all that is to say you have to know your audience. Who are you talking to? Who is in your audience? I can give the same experiment, do the same experiment for kindergartners, and yeah. I can do it for people who have PhDs in chemistry. The science is the same, but it's how deep you go into it. Right. And so I will tell you the first thing to do is look at your audience and figure out what level of science or whatever it is you're talking about, right? Like we said, history, like yeah. how deep into the history you want to go. And then you need to figure out what is your point? What is your take home message? And so what I will recommend William James's theory of emotional memory. I told you guys my parents are psychologists. This Love is it. one of the theories that we agree on. Yeah. But William James's theory of emotional memory basically states that if you have an emotional response to something, you're more likely to form a memory. And so if you want them to remember one thing from your presentation, use that. Use William James's theory of emotional memory. I personally use fire. So if I want them to remember <laughs> something, I will set my hand on fire, I'll breathe fire, I'll set this thing on fire, I'll do something, right? And then afterwards, the research shows you have about 60 seconds to actually teach people something. So if you're trying to present anything, whatever your point, the big take home point, you wanna land that right after the emotional response. And so you wanna structure your talk in a way to get them hooked, get them interesting, and then drive home that message with a big kind of showstopper. And you don't have to use fire. You can use anything. It could, you, it could be you just like standing up and explaining something. It could be like you have a big explanation. You jump off stage. Literally, there's anything you can do, but you need to be creative and be tenacious about it. Go after it. Don't be afraid to be a bit of a showman up here. Like you, you kind of need to do it. I love it. I love it. All right, I'm going to let, I feel like you can pick your favorite okay. questions. Um, how do you see science outreach playing a role in promoting science education and engagement in general public? I think it plays a huge role, a huge, gigantic role. Um, so just here in Austin, I spent a lot of time um, doing my fun with a chemistry outreach program. So I'd go out to Austin, I'd blow, schools in Austin yeah. blow stuff up. And I saw a huge difference in when I went to West Austin versus East Austin. Austin. And so for those of you, I'm sure you're, you know yeah. what I'm saying, but for those of you who aren't from here, West Austin, money, East Austin, yeah. yeah, not so much. And so when I went to West Austin schools, a lot of times the kids have seen that. They have dry ice at home. They have a tank of liquid nitrogen at their nightstand type of thing. Like they weren't that excited about it. Yeah. But when I go to East Austin schools where it's you know lower socioeconomic, I saw a huge change in what was going on. So the kids are screaming, they're, they're yelling about this, they're saying this, they have so many questions because they've never seen it before. And so quite quickly I realized that my time was better spent in these Title I right. schools mm -hmm. because you can have a greater impact. And so personally for me, in my own experience, I tend to, to focus on the Title I schools because they need it more and you can have a greater impact. You get bigger bang for your buck, essentially. Yeah. But on top of that, the research shows that a one and done doesn't do anything. So if I blow something up and then walk out the door, mm, they might get excited about it. Maybe a couple kids will like science, but what happens is if I come back the next year and do another, the consistency, and sense. just doing twice, showing up twice, the statistics jump in a huge amount. I believe that. And so you've got to come back. And so that's the biggest piece. Like you can't just show up once and then be like, cool, I'm a science entertainer. Like, no, you have to be dedicated. You need to keep going back. Show up for the kids. Find the kids in your community who are worth it. If you're here in Austin, I highly recommend the Boys and Girls Club or Girl Start. They're my two favorite organizations that I personally donate to. Amazing. 
All right, I like this TikTok question. Okay. Do you think platforms such as TikTok need to be held responsible for injuries or damage stemming from kids replicating science experiments? The platform itself, no. I don't think TikTok needs to be held responsible. I mean, they have a flag at the bottom saying don't do this at home, so it takes care of them from a legal standpoint. But I think it's true for anything online. I mean, a kid can see the fact that I breathe fire, and then they could go home and try to do it. Right. And so my lawyer has been very clear about this. Anytime I breathe fire on stage, I try to announce it. I'm not excellent about doing it in videos, the don't do it at home. Right because I feel like it's common sense, um, but maybe I should add a tag on that. But anytime I post something on TikTok, there is the flag, so I know that's safe. And then on Instagram, I guess I should be a little better about it. Wasn't there a trend where kids were eating Tide Pods oh for a while? Like, what was that? Oh, just internet stupidity is the only thing I can... <laughs> it was horrific. That's so bad for you. I, I can't even it's imagine. It's so bad. It's a mixture of, like, caustic base just going down your throat. It's yeah. nasty. It's nasty. Like, just, just don't do that. I remember in high school, the, some of the athletes they had said they were going to do drug testing and they were saying well just drink bleach and then your test will and I'm like don't don't no, do that no, I don't no, know what no, the science no, no. is on that but don't do it's that it's not good yeah. it's not good yeah no it's so never good there's dangerous stuff out there that's the crazy thing about the internet it's so it's wonderful bad. and it can be so dangerous it can be so too. bad as well yeah there are different countries out there so that I just learned this a couple days ago but the TikTok app apparently is owned like by country and so mm -hmm. you have different apps in different places okay. with different rules which makes sense right they have different yeah. laws and so in one particular country they they have made it so the algorithm for kids only shows educational pieces. And okay. so on the app, they don't get the silly dances and the goofy yeah. trends and the bad dad jokes. Those are out there. <laughs> I'm looking at all the dads in here. Um, but they only get the educational pieces. And so there are some options yeah. that platforms could use if they so choose to. Okay. There's another platform that I've been trying to partner with. It's like Zigazoo. I'm, I'm sure I'm getting that wrong, but it's for kids specifically. And so there, I'm not supposed to do anything that's like very dangerous. I would only do things like this that yeah. are innocuous that wouldn't cause harm. So if you know your audience is just kids, you need to be more careful. Totally. TikTok's for everybody. So as yeah. long as I've got that warning on there, I don't personally feel responsible. But yes, maybe I should. You. Maybe I can I can take the note. I'll be better about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. It looks like we have time for maybe one more question. Okay. So I'll let you pick. Oh, geez. Could you speak to members of the Texas legislature regarding science education? Perhaps you could encourage them to increase funding to public education. I would love to talk to the Texas government about a lot of things right now. Um, I've got a list. Science education is definitely on there. Um, so I'd sign me up. Like, if you've got someone who's willing to get yelled at for an hour, like, let's go. Um, I, uh, truthfully, though, yes, I would love to. If that opportunity ever came up, I would jump at that. I, there are some amazing people. Um, uh, Michael, um, uh, I can't think of his last name, but there's a guy named Michael here at the University of Texas who is big in that. And he is okay. very, very active in, our, in Congress, and he advocates for the university, specifically the College of Natural Sciences. So there is at least one guy out there. Michael Merkel? That's not right. It's something like that. But he's out there. You're doing a good job. Amazing. Mm -hmm. I love it. Well, I just want to say thank you so much. This has you. been so much fun. You make science so fascinating, especially when you talk about you know sex, drugs, rock and roll, <laughs> all the fun stuff. That's what I always want to know about. Now, you're going to be doing a book signing after this? I am, yes. I've got a book signing at 1130. So if you guys want to come check out and like talk to me a little bit and have any questions, I'll be there signing books. And we can also just talk about TikTok and all things crazy. And how can people follow you? Uh, my website is katethechemist.com. You can find me at katethechemist on most platforms except for Twitter. I'm k 8 the chemist because some other girl with like 12 followers oh, has it. No. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. She's a Kate in the chemist, so I will absolutely support her. Yep. And if you want to support the podcast, which please do, please do, because I want to do this forever. <laughs> um, it's on NPR. It's called Seeking a Scientist. You go to the website right now. There's a spot to sign up for your email and we'll be able to shoot you a note the second our, our podcast is actually live on all the platforms. Amazing. Well, thank you thank so you. much. Let's give her a round thank of applause. Thank you guys. Thank you so much.